Di Morrissey is one of Australia's most prolific authors, writing dozens of bestsellers. She spent decades traveling the country and the world, her adventures inspiring the story she tells. Di has now returned to live in the Manning Valley on the New South Wales Mid North Coast, the place where she was born. For many people, it would be a return to a quieter life. For Ty, it's been anything but. She's working harder than ever to give her community a voice. Di Morrissey, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you, Rosie. It's such a thrill to meet you. Thank you for having me in your wonderful home. Oh, you're welcome. It's a beautiful part of Australia. Tell me what's so special about Manning Valley. Oh, well, I was born here and in a little country town just down the road called Wigham. And my um, mother was born in the same house. This is a beautiful old dairy farming area with a wonderful history, the magnificent delta of the Manning River. I can remember my grandfather carrying me down the track through to the mill. I hadn't been here for years and years and years, and my grandparents are long gone. And then I came down here to set a book here. I just felt the pull, and so I moved here, and I love it. So it's those family with strong roots in the area that that gave you that sense of connection and returning to those. It was just like the place that holds those really first memories. And I'm surrounded by cows and horses and nice people. Sounds idyllic. And when you were five, your family moved to Lovett Bay in Sydney's Pitwater. You described it as a magical childhood. It was the bush and a very special sense of community. You had to get the ferry across the bay and it was a little isolated house, but it was a, at the time it was, I didn't realize it at my age, but there were writers and poets and Dorothea McKellar and Chip Stravity, the actor, and George Farwell, the writer. And, uh, and, and I just grew up with those kind of um, people doing interesting things. And I took, I didn't know who they were and took it for granted. But then uh, when I was 10, my, um, tragically, my um, baby brother and, and my father drowned. And it was suddenly, I was just like pulled out of my little safe. I can only ever think of how as a mother, you know, how my mother dealt with it. There's good and sad memories. It's a very special place to me. And to have your father and younger brother um, tragically die by drowning mm. must have been such a, a shock as a young girl. And I, I think, you know, I relate as well, Di, that, um, you know, my mother died when I was six. Oh, really? And, and we, we weren't really part of the grieving my father and family back then didn't share that with us until after her funeral. Well, I had exactly Gee. the same thing in that I think in trying to protect me, my mother didn't take me, didn't let me go to their funeral. Um, and so there was never closure. And you, you grow up with this, it's like something that's really painful that when you've experienced tragedy, that um, you can't share easily. The thing is, I did learn that you have to pick yourself up and, and as we women do, we, you know, we make the best of it and do what we can. Did you find that that's perhaps what your mum modelled, that she had to pick herself up? Oh, oh, Rosie, you know, the, the thing I remember most was in those early, those first few days, and I was sleeping in the bed with my mother to someone had suggested comforting, and, and I can just remember her waking up and going, what am I going to do? And like, as a kid, you feel you want to help and, and take on that role, and of course, you're a little kid. But I think I had that... Um, feeling that, you know, you, you have to always be the one to be there and help and do things and, and look after people. I think that's what you do as a child. You don't even understand that you are taking on that responsibility in those moments. In the, yeah. Then when I was a mother and I look back with my first child and think 
how how do you deal with loss like that so she became a real inspiration that you can always make the best of where you are and and also in a in a way she always told me about you know following your dreams that don't get put in a box like she, you know i think you know women in those days were your mum was left alone to raise you and she needed to find a job and she ended up being a pioneer in the tv industry she never worked in a life Amazing, but it just so happened that um, um, Chip Strafferty was living in the area, a very famous old movie star, and he said, oh, there's this new thing, television starting, you should go and learn about television, which she, which she did, and um, she ended up sort of being a secretary and then continuity girl, and then she became our first woman, you know, television director, which was, uh, an extraordinary thing for, um, you know, a, a woman... Of that era. Of that era, and, and in a very much, a, I must say, it was a terribly chauvinistic world. But she survived and she it, it was a huge role model. I grew up just assuming that women can do anything, and particularly when you have to. So I grew up always wanting to tell stories and write books. Your uncle gave you some pretty good advice. You don't leave school and become a novelist, I discovered, and my mother couldn't afford university. So my very wise um, foreign correspondent uncle said, go and be, uh, learn to be a journalist, go and work on a newspaper and be a copy girl. And best advice I could ever, ever have, have had. Your career took you to Fleet Street. Yes. Um, London in the swinging 60s, what was it like for an Australian single woman? Oh, well, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. It took me a while, uh, you know, to knock on doors and then was just given the job as woman's editor of the Daily Mail group because nobody wanted to do that. I mean, I interviewed the Rolling Stones and the Who and all wow. of these people at the time that just really didn't mean very much to me. And I look back now and think of all of these amazing people that, uh, uh, you know, that I, that I met. And, and it, was a, it was a great experience. But, you know, after four years, again, you just get up one morning and go, I can't take this weather any longer. I think I'll go home. Maybe that's why I came to Australia. Yes. <laughs> so you can just make a decision. I guess it's always brew it, brewing away, but you do have to be brave. We have to encourage women to to just step out of your, your comfort zone. Quite often it's you're forced to do it, but equally, you know, we, we should step up to some of those dreams and challenges. Being brave. And you went on to meet your future husband, Peter, and he's an, he was an American in the Peace Corps. We had this extraordinary, adventurous and amazing life, being a, a diplomatic wife. And we were in some extraordinary places. I was in Guyana when Jonestown happened and, um, you know, all, all kinds of uh, things. So you, had you been able to continue your journalistic career? At, yes, that? everywhere I went, you did. I was I held the record in the State Department for the wife, overseas wife, that had, was able to hold the most jobs ever anywhere. I was writing for the local newspapers, working in radio, interviewing people, or doing odd little TV things. But it was a very adventurous and a, and a wonderful life. But the great thing for my two children was they were exposed to mm. different languages, food, culture and poverty, and they are both now the most altruistic, um, you know, caring, special people as a result of it. I think it does really open up your, your view of the world, doesn't it, when you actually travel and, and yeah. as a, a, to be able to experience living in very different countries. Um, and, and certainly I can appreciate how isolating that can be from Australia because it is so vastly different. But experiences that you would never trade or change. So you have a wonderful relationship with Peter now, but how did you arrive at the decision that this wasn't working for you and you came back to Australia? One morning you wake up and you just go, um, I, you know, he's up here and when is it my turn? It was me of, of not 
feeling fulfilled and doing what I wanted to do, which sounds selfish. But when but isn't, you... that, isn't that what women say? Oh, I suppose. You know, it, you know it and out. it's like, I put yourself first, yeah. put yourself first. And I just had this burning thing and I, and I just, and it was a gradual process. I went to London to stay with my old uh, friend that I'd grown up with, Nick Tate, who was an actor, and, and Tom Keneally was there. And we walked around London, Tom talking about writing and the need, and it's a passion, and he said, you won't be able to stop this. It will take you over unless you try. Um, so it ended up being a, a, a very kind of a parting of the ways. And Peter going, what have I done? And, I, and I'm going, nothing, it's all my fault. And, uh, um, and the children stayed with him. They were in this brilliant international school with all of the assets of the embassy. He was in Jakarta. I came back to Sydney and I walked away with nothing. So the decision to leave the children with Peter would have been quite a different choice for a, a, a mother and a woman to make back then, Di. Did you feel judged? Did you...? Subsequently, I, f I felt judged. But um, at the time, I mean, that was, ter that was the harder that decision was... to, uh, to leave them rather than take them. But they had everything. So you, you, they adapted and you they kept... Lo yes, and they kept... came up and down. I went up and down. And they'd stay for the three months summer vacation, mm -hmm. Christmases, you know. And I, so uh, the, our none, all of us are very close. It's been no damage. If anything, the children are... Have benefited. ...are really... Um, uh, they've been exposed to so many interesting and cultural and awareness and they're extraordinary, altruistic, well-adjusted, um, amazing kids. So you came back to Sydney to write, but you needed to earn a living and you joined Good Morning Australia as a reporter. Yes. Well, it was the first we'd never had breakfast television. Everyone said Australians would watch it. And I'd been very exposed to Good Morning America in America. And I went, this is a no-brainer. This is going to work. And I thought, you 3 a.m. To, to 7 on air, 9, you're home by 10. And then I could spend the rest of the day writing. Well, the one slot left was the entertainment reporter, which meant going to the movies at night, interviewing movie stars at all times of the day. So... For eight years, you know, I was working from 3 a.m. to, you know, 11 p.m. And I had no time. And was suddenly, that was after the eight years, you think, what happened to the dream of writing books? So I just quit. I had very little money. I didn't own a house. I had nothing. I, you know, I mean, television in those days wasn't paid uh, uh, tremendously well. I thought, if I don't make a stab at this, you'll never know. So another courageous, brave move. Um, so you seem you're like you're not afraid to start all over again or to take risks. Where do you think that well, comes from? Well, you say that, and that still sounds so not me. It's just um, I don't consider that what I'm doing is being brave and taking steps and outside the norm. Or, uh, but I realise it is. But at the time, you don't do you do it for the right reasons following your heart think, yeah you're filling your it's passion. that you've pretty much written a book every year for the past 30 years and you've sold millions of copies of your novels does that feel like success to you it certainly looks like success the way i said but does that um, feel like success yes it's fulfilling um but each time I, I sit down to write a book, I just go, I don't know how to do this. You can't really learn it. Y you know, God gives us all gifts mm. and I can tell a story. So I do, I, each book is a nerve-wracking experience. Still, after 30. Absolutely. I start a book and I have no plan. I don't have a, you know, a schedule or, you know, other than time. Um, I don't know how a book's going to end until I'm almost there. You know, it's instinct, so you kind of go with that. And... I mean, I'm sitting here looking at a bookcase full of books and thinking, how did I do that? <laughs> and, you know, each book, every time you get that in the mail, the first copy, the first edition of your book, it's just like, it's just as exciting as it was. The, you never take it for granted. There's your name on the cover. It's, it's, so it still yeah, means as much still, to you. It still, yeah. 
I mean, maybe because I know the blood, sweat and tears that, that, that go into it. And I mean, I'm in a position where my kids are safe, married, happy, kids, and um, I've got a lovely partner. I'm living in a lovely spot. It wasn't always like this, but now um, I have the freedom. I used to read as a young child from when I lost my mum and loved to read. Are you an only child? No, I have three younger brothers, but I loved reading. It was my safe place. Yeah, yeah. It was what I did when other kids were out playing. It was part of me adapting to my life without my mum. And I've loved books and they mean a lot to me. I don't give any away. I keep them all. Yeah, yeah. But when it came, you know, when I lost my son and the opportunity came to write a book, I have a wonderful ghostwriter that writes with me, um, Bryce, and and the book came from both of us, but I can still remember how amazing it is to have a book on the bookshelf that is oh, mine, with your name that's on come it. from me, that has got, you know, and, and it can never be taken from you. And that if, if that's the only book in my whole life I write, what an amazing achievement. So oh, you're going to write more. I can that's tell what we that. Keep saying. You've got it. you've got the bug in there. I can tell. Yes. Well, I, I need to get through that being brave because it is a very overwhelming thing. It's so overwhelming I can't start. You so. know what? You don't it, you don't think of it like that. You just think of you're just telling one story to one other person. You know like a letter. Sit down and, and because once you share like you and I are once and women are really good at that, um, you find that in just you things will come from that you have forgotten or that you know you you really pour your heart out on the page. I always think who who would be interesting in these details? Don't care about them. Don't care about them. You write for you. That was what I thought because when I first went on television and it was terrifying. They said, there's thousands of people out there. And then the cameraman said, just look at that red light and it's just me. You talk, you're only talking to one other person. It's one plus one. So then, then you don't, the fear goes. And writing is the same. It's you and just that one person. The, of course, the book is only read by one person at this time. It's a unique one-on-one -on -one experience. So your partner, Boris, was it? Childhood sweetheart. No, he, well, no, it, ne it never got to that stage. Boris was, um, he's Croatian and his family had come out here and he was my mother's, like, junior cinematographer. He was a very good, when my mother was a television director at our Transit Film Studios. And when I was about 15, I went to the Christmas staff party and Boris asked me to dance. Apparently he was quite enamoured and I thought he was lovely, but he didn't talk very much. He was very embarrassed about his accent. Um, but he was lovely. But he, m over the years, Mum kept saying, oh, I saw Boris and Boris is married and Boris has kids and whatever, whatever. And there was just that link there. Anyway, when I ran away to write books and I'm in Byron Bay and I went to a dinner party and there's this fellow there and I said, are you Boris Janjic's brother? You're the animator? Because they were making an animation film. And I said, oh, how's Boris? And he said, Boris is single. And I went, give me his phone number. <laughs> and we haven't been apart since. So your, your own story sounds very much like a novel too, Di. Have you, <laughs> written, have you written your own autobiography I yet? don't think I could. I don't think... I think there's bits of me in every book when I look at them in retrospect. My kids go, oh, that didn't that happen? I go, oh, yeah, maybe it did. <laughs> <laughs> so you and Boris decided to move back to Munning Valley, at a place that you haven't lived in since you were five years old. Why was the pull to return home so strong? I just was overcome when I took Boris around to show him, as he'd never been here when we first came down here, this is where this happened and this is where my uncle and this is where my mum went to the bush school and my father was born over there and this is where my grandfather taught me. And there's my grandfather's house unchanged, except they painted the cedar cupboards pink in the kitchen, but, um, but, but all there, really. And, um, and I just went... This is where my roots are. This is where I belong. I'm very interested in, in, in this stage of your life, Di, because 
I've lived in Australia for 30 odd years. I've stopped counting, but I think it's almost 35 years. And I've always said one day I will go back to England where all my family are. And I am looking at the potentially going back at the same time as you've come back to your roots. Mm. And I, how do you fit back in? Are you welcome back to, to communities? Are you always, in, you know, it, it, sometimes communities are tight. Um, yeah. they, they're not welcoming. They, they're established and they've been the same for a long time. And going back isn't always what you thought it was going to be. You know that old cliche about, you know, after 30 years you might be a local. But it's up to you. Did You have to also make the effort, get involved, join things. There are so many amazing, interesting people living here. And I have found wherever I have lived, in all of the country, everywhere I've been, I've always found really amazing, interesting people because I guess you kind of gravitate, or but you do make the effort. I talk to everyone wherever I am. I stop and talk to people. I'm always yarning. Oh, so tell me your story. Well, who are you? Where are you from? I mean, you know, you're standing in the queue, whatever. So, A, it's supposed as part of the journalism, but people have the most amazing stories. And then they go, oh, well, why don't you come around for a cup of tea and we can talk about, you know, you have to put out there. My cousin is now living in my grandfather's house. It's wonderful. I think that's symmetry, they, you know, of going full, full circle. And has it changed? No. Oh, I mean, some things are modernised. I mean, you know... But the, the spirit of the place, the oh, essence yes. of the place. You know, except, as they say, you know, how it all seemed smaller and, you know, and, the, and, and the rooms are all closed off because it was, you know, Federation style. But I can still remember, I walk in that hallway and the doors to the two lounge room doors open and I used to go in at uh, my grandparents sat by the fire, either side of the fire, in you go... And I would perform every night. I would recite a poem. I'd do my little, little stuff on the stage. <laughs> I still feel that. Ex except it all seems so little. It seems, you know, so it seems little. smaller. <laughs> so since you've been back here, you've found yourself in a bit of a David and Goliath style battle against a plan to build new power lines in the region. And, and you won. Yes, it was, um, they wanted to build massive transgrid towers through dairy farm and beautiful agricultural land, totally unnecessary. The population was not growing, they were not needed. We formed a community group and for 18 months, led by um, uh, now councillor Peter Epov, we fought together and we stopped this 262 million dollar project. But during that time, there was very little, this was not being massively covered by the local newspaper. And so that was when I thought, no, no, this isn't right, so we need to start our own proper, independent, local newspaper. So we did. I was going to say, tell me about the Manning, it's the Manning Community News, that's what it's called. Yes. Tell me about that. And so we decided to start this local paper. So uh, you're the journalist, everybody said, so you do it. And I thought, oh, put the paper together, go around town, ask all the local businesses to advertise in it, no-brainer. Um, do this in my spare time. Anyway, no one would advertise. So again, my back kind of went up and I went, no, the community needs this. Well, I'll just keep doing it. So I now, that was seven years ago, six, seven years ago, so I now produce a, a monthly full newspaper that has exposed a lot of the community trusts me and trusts the paper, and it's now their only avenue often to get help. So you're funding this newspaper at a time when people are typically getting out of publishing. Why do you think it's important for the community to have a local newspaper? A local newspaper is just that. I mean, it's local. And in a country area, people like the physical newspaper, a print. They so don't do the... I mean, it's social online. Social media. They yeah, you go, to, you go uptown and you get a cup of tea and you pick up the local newspaper. We get the city papers. But where do we find out what plans the council have? How do we get our roads fixed? This doesn't work. That doesn't work. And, um, you know, the council's not terribly good at, you know, community consultation. And there's a lot of things that, that have been happening that people are not happy about. Or they're not being done in the, the right way. Development... Uh, 
are um, losing koala habitat and the environment. So people look to the newspaper and if they can't get questions, uh, answers anywhere else, they, they come to the newspaper. So the newspaper has filled a void and now at the time where we desperately, with the monopolising of, of you know, mainstream media, the power of I the independent and regional newspapers and suburban papers in Sydney or cities is vital, absolutely vital. It's really being crushed in, in a way with the, you know, two main monopolies uh, and the same thing in every paper. So I just feel that this is the, the time now that we really need to support independent um, um, newspapers. So most people move to a small community for a quieter life. You seem to be busier than ever. Still writing books. Yes. Started a community newspaper. Um, what do you do in your downtime? Do you have any downtime? Um, <laughs> oh, well, but it doesn't seem like downtime. I mean, I'm always doing something. I mean, we've got two acres and so we've got a garden and we grow vegetables and we have, have chooks and, uh, you know, I'm always seeing people and doing things and, uh, you know, I have a back door that a few whistleblowers like to come in periodically and so, uh, I, yeah, I keep, um, I mean, I love to sit down and read a book as well, um, but people say, what are you going to do when you retire? I mean, why would I retire? What would I do? <laughs> I don't know. So at this stage of my life, I hardly have any money because I'm paying for the paper and one thing or another. But what's important is uh, w what you're doing and what you're giving back. And the full giving is making you feel good. It enriches you, it, doesn't it? It does. It does. You've moved a lot in your life. Do you think this is it now? Oh, look around, Rosie. <laughs> When the bushfires came, I just went, what do you grab first? I, mean, I couldn't begin to imagine. This is it. Um, yes, I see no reason to move. I can move a home and a family every two years and within two weeks it looks like we've lived there for decades. So that was one. Uh, so I have done my travelling. I still like travelling, but this is home. This is home. Genuinely home. Di Morrissey. Thank you for joining me on OnePlus One. Oh, thank you, Rosie. You're a joy to chat to.